Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and welcome to our uh, mainline series uh, hosted by Dr. John Noggle. Uh, before I turn it over to him, I would first like to say thanks to our sponsors of our mainline series, uh, James Gately, John Piasecki, and Eileen Rosenau. Uh, John Noggle, uh, thank you for hosting us today. Uh, thank you and the Haverford School. Uh, John, as most of you know, is the um, ninth headmaster of the Haverford School, and he's also a senior fellow at FPRI. Uh, he was the president of the Center for a New American Security in Washington, D.C., and remains a non-resident senior fellow. There he's also the author of Knife Fights, a Memoir of Modern War, and Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife. Uh, this afternoon, um, our um, our Middle East Program Director and our Director of Research, uh, Dr. Aaron Stein, will be taking us around uh, the Middle East and um, discussing some of the foreign policy challenges for the new administration. Um, so uh, a couple housekeeping notes. If you have questions, and we encourage you to, to put them in the Q&A box, you can start doing that anytime. And uh, put them in the Q&A, not the chat. If you put them in the chat, there's a chance we won't see them. The chat, though, however, if you do have a technical problem, um, do put your questions in there, and uh, we will help you as soon as we see it. Um, we'll also be putting some maps in the, in the chat window uh, to help you orient yourself. And finally, we will be recording. We are recording this video, and if you miss part of it or just want to watch it again or refer it to your friends, you'll be able to find this event online. So without further ado, let me turn it over to, to John. Thanks so much, Raleigh, and uh, let me join you in welcoming all of our watchers, participants, to a snowy version of the main line briefings. Uh, really excited to be here today with Dr. Aaron Stein, a man who wears many hats and has worn them in many places. Uh, Aaron, um, as Raleigh mentioned, is the Director of Research as well as the Director of the Middle East Program and also Acting Director of the National Security Program at FPRI. He hosts the Arms Control Wonk and the Middle East Brief podcasts. He was a doctoral fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy in Switzerland, an associate fellow of the Royal United Services Institute in London, and the Nonproliferation Program Manager at the Center for Economics and Foreign Policy Studies in Istanbul. He's widely published in journals such as Survival, the Journal of the Royal United Services Institute, and such periodicals as Foreign Affairs, War on the Rocks, and the American Interest. Uh, he started his uh, higher education at the University of San Francisco, stayed in California, got his master's degree at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California, and got his doctorate in Middle East and Mediterranean Studies at King's College London. I don't know of anybody who's been more cooler places than Aaron at this early point in his career. And I'd like Thank to commend you. him not just for his Middle East knowledge, but also for his taste in research locations. Uh, Aaron, great to have you with us. I'm, I'm gonna start off by talking about uh, some of the, the late flurry of Middle East activities that we've seen from the Trump administration. Get your sense of, of what's going on there and importantly, of how lasting these initiatives are going to be coming as they do at the end of this administration. Well, thanks for having me. And I would say my latest locale is my basement. Uh, and my basement on a, um, on, a, on a snowy day, it's just started to snow for those of us on the East Coast, uh, which means all four of us are in the house, meaning two kids under five. So if you hear screaming and yelling upstairs, I promise you uh, it's not out of any sort of uh, pain. Uh, it's because uh, it's snowing and we have two children under five. And my wife is with them. Uh, now on to your question. Look, I, I think that the changes that are ongoing in the Middle East are, you know, making overt or formalizing what had once been clandestine. Like sort of the big secret was, is that the shared antipathies throughout the Middle East, particularly as it pertains to Iran, had allowed for quiet and clandestine, you know, interactions and talks between the sort of the Gulf Arab, the Sunni Gulf Arab states uh, and the state of Israel. And I think where the Trump administration, you know, deserves credit is that, you know, through iterative processes over the course of the four years, 
is that they move forward to make these these, these ones quiet, these ones clandestine um, um, arrangements more formal. Uh, and I do think that these will be durable because the political costs um, that these Arab regimes in particular um, in, uh, uh, undertook to to you know it, you know they're called peace agreements, but they're really formal for, formalized you know f uh, uh, you know formal recognition re recognition agreements. The political costs that they undertook to to formally recognize the state of Israel were considerable, even if these states are authoritarian. Um, uh, and so the leadership has an incentive to continue to keep this going along. Uh, I would say that the odd party out, of course, is the parties that, you know, are at least locked in frozen conflict and sometimes very active conflict with the state of Israel and that being the Palestinians, you know. And so, you know, one thing that the Biden administration will inherit as they move in is the sort of the intractable, in, intractable, I should say, problem in the Middle East, which is that the, 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 the resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict um, um, you know, doesn't seem to be in the offing. It's not politically tangible either in the Palestinian Authority uh, or in uh, uh, the state of Israel as we currently see it. And so peace becomes more difficult between those two parties, even if the broader Middle East is coming to formalize or recognize the state of Israel as both a mutual security partner in the case of Dubai or sorry, the United Arab Emirates with the, with the traffic between Dubai as a commercial um, 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 trading partner uh, and certainly probably in the clandestine um, um, field of, of working together to counter the, the, the threat from the Islamic Republic of Iran. I think you're on mute, John. It does work better when you unmute. Mm. Uh, and, and so let's spend a little more time on the, the Palestinians who, who arguably um, uh, fared the worst during the Trump uh, administration. And has, has their position, has the fact that they are um, suffering from the, 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 um, the, the weakness, the relative weakness of their position, does that actually give them a, sort of a reverse strength going into the Biden administration? How do you see, how do you see the Biden administration dealing with the Palestinians? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think, I think one of the advantages that the, that the Biden administration, well, this will both be an advantage and disadvantage for relations with the Middle East. Uh, and I'll talk about the advantages here, is that there is a lineage and track record for most of the senior officials that are going in, um, um, that we know of thus far, uh, with the Biden administration, beginning with Joe Biden himself. Obviously, he was the vice president for eight years. And before he was vice president, he was a longstanding senator uh, who had an interest in, in, in foreign relations. Uh, and so, you know, I, and then, you know, the advantage is, is that the, the, the problems that, that, that they left behind um, are more or less the similar problems that they will inherit as it pertains to the Israel-Palestine conflict. And therefore, they won't need a lot of spin up um, um, to, to get up to speed on the file and, and to pick up more or less where they left off or where the Trump administration is leaving it. I think the challenges that they're going to face say, is that the resolution to this is growing more and more difficult because of when political trends uh, uh, in Israel, um, again, political trends in the Palestinian Authority itself, obviously the, the, the role of Hamas in, in, in Gaza uh, as this sort of big, out, as this big bugaboo that, that needs to be dealt with. And also just like by, by happenstance of the growing number of Israeli settlements is just the small, the, the, the decreasing space in which Palestinians live. You know, so if you put all these things together, you know, the problems, uh, 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 you know, just don't seem to have easy answers, even if the answers are relative, you know, are, are things that have been identified um, a, and put forward in previous solutions to the peace agreement, uh, if, if never um, um, been able to act upon. I would say the Palestinians now are probably at the weakest they've ever been. Their leadership, particularly um, in the West Bank, is, is, is geriatric, um, lacking of authority, um, lacking of legitimacy, I should say. Um, unable to deliver services to their people in any sort of real way. Um, and with the Abraham Accords, you know, one outcome of that is sort of the Palestinian issue is no longer the main driver of Arab-Israeli politics writ large. You know, it is now just been downgraded within the broader struggle between the Iranians and sort of broadly speaking, the Gulf Arabs. And do you see the Biden administration putting pressure on Israel, uh, re-emphasizing this question of Palestinian rights? I, I, from the early indications, and again, I have no inside knowledge, I have no idea, you know, but one assumes is that the, the, 
the sort of is that the Trump administration is a historical outlier. I mean, well, maybe it's the new norm going forward for right of center U.S. governments, but certainly I think it's an outlier in terms of how the Israelis were treated or at least were, were given um, um, you know, freedom, I should say, from criticism on a lot of human rights issues and that a left of center U.S. government will be different. Now, with that said, you know, and while there has been problems, particularly with the partisanization of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, particularly pertaining to the you know, Bibi Netanyahu and his pushback against the JCPOA, which you can probably get into, um, and his very frosty relationship with former President Obama, uh, is that you know the the, the big danger um, is that um, from the Israeli side is that this has become a partisan food fight in Washington. Now, with that said, um, I do think that the majorities where the real sort of like oomph of the relationship is maintained, which is in that massive foreign aid package that the U.S. provides Israel every single year, is intact. And so you know, Israel will get its billions of dollars uh, from the United States um, 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 as part of its foreign aid package. Um, and that that element of the relationship is intact. So even if the Biden administration were to be sort of more pro-Palestinian, and I'm putting those in air quotes, uh, you know, it won't necessarily be detrimental to the security ties and political ties between the two states. And a, a question from Frank Hoffman. Uh, Frank asked, to what degree is the last administration's chummy relationship with BB, Frank's words, the acceptance of the embassy shift, the annexation of the Golan Heights, going to re retard or degrade the political interaction with the Israeli government or the Biden team? And Frank asks, uh, would a Netanyahu departure help? Oh, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I and mean, one of the advantages that, that Biden has is, again, he knows these people. He's dealt with BB. BB has been around for a very long time. You know, and so I'm, I, I am of the opinion that this will not be a repeat of the Obama administration. So, like, that's a guess, right? But, you know, the, 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 host, the overt hostilities between Obama and Netanyahu, I don't think will translate into the hostilities between Biden and Netanyahu. They may, like, have their friction points and there may be disagreements and problems in, 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 in the bilateral relationship. But I don't think we're going to be approaching anything on the level of the hostility that we saw between 2008 and 2016. Um, with that said, you know, if the Israelis, if the Biden administration, and I think that this will be their top line um, priority in the Middle East, you know, like if, because if we're really ranking Biden administration priorities, I would probably put the Middle East at like a distant third, like Asia Pacific would probably be number one, you know, Russia, NATO, Europe, you know, that sort of big conglomeration being two, and then really lower beneath that would be the Middle East in terms of prioritization. And so, and then if you prioritize that, I think that their main focus will be on handling the Iranian nuclear issue rather than dealing with, 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 with Israel. And that's where you could interject tensions. And, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to Iran here in just a moment, Aaron, if we can. Um, I'm, I'm gonna remind you that Lyndon Johnson wanted to prioritize the great society, but Vietnam kept getting in the way and so the fact that the Biden administration would like to decrease the, the amount of resources consumed by the Middle East, it continues to be a place that produces more history than it can consume locally. Uh, and, and so uh, my, expe my expectation is that the Middle East will continue to be an area of focus. What's your, and Frank's uh, uh, follow-on question, the, the questions are coming in and they're fantastic. Um, what, is, what is your sense of Netanyahu's strength uh, as a, uh, um, is his tenure going to continue for some time? Is that likely? Well, I, I mean, we've seen, you know, basically political turmoil in Israel with multitudes of elections being held um, um, and his coalition being relatively shaky, as well as him having legal issues. And then the concurrent problems that all governments are facing, which is the combination of COVID-19 lockdowns, you know, perceived failures in managing the pandemic, both perceived and real, and then the economic strains that, 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 that follow on from both. Um, and so I would say, while he's not as strong as he used to be, um, um, he nevertheless remains a salient and um, you know, relatively popular po politician and has been able to, um, you know, I guess use sort of populist rhetoric to, re to retain, populist rhetoric and, and, and far right outreaches to retain political power. 
And I'm, you know, perhaps this is my influence from Turkey, but I'm always of the opinion um, that somebody has to win before you can ultimately begin to uh, uh, think about alternatives and political power. I, I really mean this because I always hear about the opposition is gaining strength in Turkey and it never does. Um, and so, you know, we've been hearing that this is Netanyahu's sort of downturn for the last four election cycles, and he always manages to escape. And so until he's unseated, I'm just going to assume that he's going to stay in power. And that uh, that does seem like a, a strong possibility. Uh, you, you went to Iran. We've got a number of questions going to Iran. Uh, can we get your assessment of the success or lack thereof of uh, President Trump's maximum pressure campaign on Iran? Um, so I'll start with the success. You know, the success is, 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 very narrow, I, I would argue. And the success is, is that the outset of when Donald Trump withdrew from the JCPOA and went down the, 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 the policy of maximum pressure, there was sort of a, 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 a let's say, a, 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 a there was sort of a, a consensus, or consensus is too strong a word. There was a concern, you know, that the United States was going to overuse sanctions and that the sanctions that would be placed back upon Iran would not have the same level of bite as they did pre-2012 because there wouldn't be as bright, widespread support for them because Iran uh, remained in relatively good standing in the JCPOA. That consensus or, or near consensus proved to be false. And the success is, is that despite sort of concerns about over-sanctioning, about despite concerns that sanctions would cause a fleeing from the dollar globally, uh, the sanctions have had a considerable bite that the Iranians have felt the pressure. And you can see that reflected in, you know, look, to the extent that you can trust them, internal Iranian economic numbers, but also tangible hard um, numbers that come from um, uh, the measuring of Iranian energy exports. It is no doubt that they are, they, are, they, are, they are suffering from maximum pressure. But here's where I would say there's a failure, okay? And the failure is, is that, you know, the sanctions relief that was traded to Iran as part of the JCPOA was essentially, like if you, we really want to be crude about it, it, is like we were paying them with their own money not to do things we don't like and to accept intrusive inspections for 25 years. So what the United States has lost is we are no longer a part of the JCPOA, so we don't have access to that intrusive inspections. And as U.S. pressure has increased, so has Iranian counter pressure. And the Iranian counter pressure has come in skirting some of the lines of the JCPOA um, 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 on the limits of, of, of enriched uranium, but also in regional actions. And those regional actions have come within the pressuring of the global oil market. So basically they're saying, if we can't export oil, we're gonna signal that it's gonna be difficult to export oil in the region. So you can talk about the placing of limpet mines on international shipping um, just off their coast, you know, in, in, in Emirati waters, and then most sort of spectacularly with the, um, with the, with the, with the strike on Abkhaz and Kureis, the, the Saudi Aramco facilities in Saudi Arabia. And concurrent to this, you can also see their actions in Yemen and Iraq. So this is not an Iran that's being deterred from aggressive action. It's an Iran that's turned to aggressive action as punishment, I would argue, for the maximum pressure strategy. So I would say that is where you've seen a failure uh, of, 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 of U.S. policy. Oh, but but uh, Iran's counter has not been particularly successful, I would argue. No, it hasn't been particularly successful, but it's been detrimental to those strategic aims, as you've been talking about. So if the U.S. priority going back to Obama, continuing through the Trump administration, you know, two ideologically opposed administrations, I, I would say Barack Obama and Donald Trump do not like each other. I think that that's pretty, um, pretty well known. I think both men have made that relatively clear. But if the through line between both administrations, Democrat and Republican, has been we need to get out of these wars in the Middle East. Now they've been sticky, obviously Islamic State and all that and all that jazz, you know. But if the priority in the Trump administration, at least as he articulates it, is is that the U.S. needs to be out of the the business of starting wars in the Middle East, the Iranian counter moves have been effective in so much as they've been a distraction from the broader efforts the U.S. national security policy and strategists would like to do, which is focus on Asia Pacific and Europe. And, and we'll, we'll talk to some of the specifics of those Middle East wars in, in just a moment and the Trump administration's efforts to, to um, spin them further down. But I want to spend a few more minutes on Iran. 
uh, because the, certainly the focus of the Obama administration policy on Iran was preventing its nuclear weapons capability. Mm -hmm. And uh, Iran has made, um, I don't know if breakout moves is too strong, but has certainly broken out of the terms of the agreement and restarted uh, its, uh, put more resources into its nuclear weapons program. To what effect? So there is no doubt that Iran had a clandestine nuclear weapons program put in place. You know, you can backdate it. You know, half my PhD was on the Iran running nuclear program. You, I backdated it to 1987, but you can backdate it to any, any sort of date you want. You know, but there is no doubt that they had a nuclear weapons program. And there is no doubt that the tacit knowledge gained from that clandestine nuclear weapons program doesn't go away. Right, you can't unlearn something once you've done it. You may get a little rusty, but like you'll figure it out eventually, as you throw yourself back into a project. And so the Iranian gains from, you know, as I would say, 16 years of of considered nuclear weapons research, isn't going to go away. It will never go away. Um, it just is what it is. We also know from, you know, the release of the documents that you know the Israeli archive that they spirited out of Tehran a couple of years ago is that you know most of what we thought we knew about the Iranian nuclear weapons program is true i.e. that like basically they had a full up program this wasn't some serious some some random scientists just experimenting on their own there was a top down government program to go from enrichment to weaponization to delivery all three together we also are told, at least from you know, the Bush era administration national intelligence estimate is that that program was halted. And, or, or, and I, I never liked the word halt because what they meant was paused, was that that, that that program was paused in 2003 with some sort of tangible little things floating around the outside that they may have continued. What the JCPOA did was it, in, in, in very simplistic terms, it centralized all Iranian enrichment at one place. It put full-time monitoring at that place and all the front end stuff that goes into enrichment from mining to milling to conversion, all that fun stuff. It placed inspections along each end of that trajectory, which isn't normal under, IE, I, under IAEA inspection regimes. And then most importantly, in, it forced the Iranians to, to declare where they make centrifuges, and those were placed on their monitor and seal. And, the, and so you couldn't secretly build an enrichment facility, or at least it would be extremely difficult to do so. And that would give the US and the other members of the P5 enough warning time if the Iranians decided to sneak out, i.e. build a clandestine facility in the side of a mountain that we couldn't bomb. And in re return for that, there were sort of sub restrictions that would come off, the last of which would have come off or still will come off essentially in 2040, which is the inspection, which is the, 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 uh, the monitoring on the, um, on the centrifuges. Um, where they're where where they're made. It was a very good agreement. Like I, I my MA is in nonproliferation and, and nuclear weapons. This was an ironclad agreement. It, it its portrayal in the media is quite unfortunate. Now, and then as part of that, they had to drive down their 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 um their surplus or at least the, the amount of uh, enriched uranium that, that they they produce on, on an each day. Uh, to a certain level so that if they were to choose to re-enrich it to weapons level, it would take about a year. What they have been doing recently is what they have been saying and what they have done is that they have skirted the low limits on the amount of stockpiled low enriched uranium that they can have. They've gone up in 30 day increments um, in, in response to US sanctions. Now that number, that stockpile of LEU is still so much lower than where we were in 2000. And, I mean, it's, it's just, it's order of magnitudes lower than where we were. So the question is, is are we better off? We are, but are we worse off than we were in 2016 with the JCPOA? Yes, we are worse off. And where I would, I worry, right? Um, is, you know, with the assassination of Mohsan Fakri, Fak Fakirzadeh, um, is that we are actually incentivizing uh, the, 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 the further uh, uh, erosion of the JCPOA. 
and you know, the JCPOA was unique because it came up, it was sort of like the perfect storm. You had Obama who came in, who was willing to talk to them. And you had an Iranian government that came in that was willing to talk to Obama. If you don't have those two ingredients, it doesn't work. And Iran is having its own elections. Now, yes, Iran is an authoritarian society. Yes, Iran is not free and fair in their elections. And yes, Iran is not liberal. But their domestic politics still do matter. And if you get some sort of really sharp government in there, like Ahmadinejad or somewhere from that sort of political um, space, that magic sauce that allowed for the JCPOA isn't so magic. And it's actually oil and water. And they won't come, and we're, we're not going to be able to, to reach an agreement. And so that effort of the Biden administration may not be as easy as it was, but that was very hard um, uh, back about a decade ago. Well, oil and water is a nice, uh, right, could, could be a nice metaphor for the Middle East. Uh, but, but what we're seeing, uh, Aaron, pushing back a little bit, uh, is, is uh, openness um, from Team Biden to resume JCPOA, perhaps immediately. And uh, my opinion, um, far more restraint from the Iranian regime than we might have expected, given the military actions taken against some of their most important actors, both by the United States and uh, at least plausibly by Israel over the course of the last year. Yeah. And, and so um, th this, that would argue, my opinion, would argue for your assessment that the sanctions have been more effective uh, than, than perhaps you might have expected and giving more credit to the Trump administration uh, that, that uh, the maximum pressure campaign has been applied not just to Iran, but also to America's allies around the globe not to resume trade with Iran. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, look, the U.S., I mean, the, it's often forgotten as we sort of navel gaze and we talk about all our problems, um, has quite amount of influence and power around the world, particularly when it comes to sanctions. I mean, the, prim the primacy of the U.S. dollar and the effectiveness of Treasury and OFAC uh, should not be understated. Uh, and the Iranians have been feeling the pressure. There's no doubt about that, you know, but I, you know, sanctions are a coercive tool. Sanctions don't give you leverage unless you're willing to trade that leverage for something. You know, it's like you know, owning a house, you know, like, you know, at some point the value is going to come down, you know, and then it becomes a depreciating asset. You know, <laughs> you know, that's not the greatest analogy, but you know, you, you want to sell high uh, rather than sell low. Um, and the question is, is are we willing to trade any leverage that the Trump administration created um, for reciprocal concessions from the Iranians? And what is it that we want from the Iranians? You know, the Iranians have said, you know, intermittently, depending on who you're talking to in the government, is no, we won't return to the JCPOA or like you have to drop all sanctions and return to the JCPOA. Those are things that can be managed. You know, like we, we can manage a timetable to return to the JCPOA. The problem is, is that the Iranians have not stood still as we have left the JCPOA, you know, talking about the, the violation of some of the sublimits. And so, you know, the Biden administration is inheriting a different Iran than the Iran of 2016. The other thing that you keep hearing is that, you know, there has to be some sort of limits on Iranian missiles right, is that problem is, okay, is that the Iranians aren't the only country in the Middle East who has missiles. The Israelis have missiles, the Emiratis have missiles, the Saudis have missiles, uh, the Turks have missiles. I mean, both sides of the Yemen civil war have missiles. Uh, you know, I can keep, Egypt has missiles. I can keep going around this mental map in my head. And so if you were to say to the Iranians, you have to put a cap on your missiles, you know, they can easily say, well, yeah, we're okay with that, but you need a region-wide ban. <laughs> or if you're going to say you, you're going to put a cap on missiles that say 2,000 kilometers, right? Like, how do you verify that? Do you put in place an inspection regime, a verification protocol? If you have a verification protocol, do, do, you know, you can just go down the line of how complicated this gets and very, very fast. Uh, and so, you know, I've always thought that missiles are something that we, you can do, um, but it's, it, it's a region-wide thing. Um, and your best bet is to take away the nasty things you don't want on top of those missiles. And so that gets me always back to the nuclear program. And I always thought the Obama administration was smart to prioritize nonproliferation as its top goal in the region, you know, as something to take away because it is ultimately the thing that, in my opinion, is most salient 
for U.S. interests, um, which is preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. And uh, you answered Dorothy's question there with, uh, with the missiles, which is fantastic. Um, I'd, I'd like to move uh, off of Iran for a moment. We may come back to it, but let's, uh, let's progress further around the uh, Middle East that the Biden administration would like to be less, uh, in which the Biden administration would like to be less engaged and, and talk a little bit about the Trump administration's troop reductions in Iraq and uh, what those mean for the future of the U.S. effort to stabilize that unfortunate country. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I would say one of the main tensions that we saw throughout the entirety of the Trump administration was balancing his, his, you know, overt and like again, not hard to understand. If you go back and read one of his first foreign policy interviews when he was candidate Trump. You know, go back even further. I mean, if you go back to Operation Earnest Will of the late 1980s, which is the American escort of um, of, of 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 oil tankers in the Persian Gulf during the Iran Iraq War, Donald Trump takes out a a ad. I can't remember which one it is. Basically saying like, why are we protecting? I believe it was Japanese oil tankers. The Japanese should be paying us to uh, to escort them, right? <laughs> if you transpose this onto his interview as candidate Trump in 2015 with the New York Times, I believe it was David Sanger and Maggie Haberman. He talks a lot about how countries in the Middle East free ride off the back of American power. We give them protection in return for basically nothing. And that if they want the American military in the Middle East, they have to pay us. Okay. So basically you have to pay for the United States to, um, to be there because, and you know, he's 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 never very good at articulating himself. You know, he has difficulty. I don't mean that as a slight. He just does. And like, what he means is like, the global good that comes about from stability in this part of the world also helps our adversaries, including Iran and Russia. You know, he says this, and so Iran and Russia should take a greater role. You know, in this, and of course, this this causes a lot of friction. But one of his main throughputs is that these wars in the Middle East, particularly against Islamic State, should be handled by regional actors themselves. And so we should offload a bunch of responsibilities to them. And of course, like, uh, 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 and so, you know, but he's fought against his own administration because his, his, his administration has not been very well organized. Again, this isn't a partisan partisan statement. This is just the truth. You know, his appointees throughout the different levels of the bureaucracy don't necessarily share the points of view of their president, and so they resist elements of his directives because he can't really sort of push those directives down. And so we kind of get this chaos. And at the end of his administration, you're seeing the fruits of that chaos, which is that you know the removal of Secretary Esper as as Secretary of Defense, the imposition of of, of acting Secretary Miller. And then the rapid move to begin to implement elements of the president's agenda that he's long wanted to do, that being the drawdown of forces from Iraq, the drawdown of forces from Afghanistan, um, and potential drawdown of forces from Syria. But like when you put them all together, um, we will still have a, a, a residual presence you know, after Donald Trump leaves office. And I, I, I do want to push back in general against this idea that the U.S. is leaving the Middle East. You know, the U.S. isn't leaving anywhere. The, the amount of infrastructure and hardware that's sprinkled throughout the, the Gulf Arab states and Jordan and all these places is tremendous. But we are certainly drawing down from the artificially high levels, I would say, that was imposed upon the Middle East as a result of the 9-11 wars. And so are we going back to sort of like the 1990s <laughs> Or, or something before that, I'm not sure. But that's how I more or less view the Trump administration's troop drawdowns as, as sort of emblematic of the problems of governance that I think permeated his administration for four years. And, and as the fulfillment of campaign promises and, and longstanding beliefs. Correct. You did a nice job of highlighting that. Uh, let me dig in just a little bit deeper in the, the specific countries of, of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, some have made the argument that uh, Trump is drawing down forces just enough to make the residual force remaining simply targets. All, uh, mm -hmm. they, they barely have enough left 
to defend themselves, much less to take actions that would promote the stability or, or continued survival of those governments. It, it's totally true. Yeah. I mean, that's the, so that's the problem of strategy, right? So if we have a national defense strategy, which prioritizes great power competition and sort of competition with nation states and China and Russia being number one and number two, right? But you still ascribe maximalist missions to US forces in the Middle East, but while drawing them down, but without changing those missions, you put more strain on US forces. And I, frankly, I, I, I just, I, I find it, I, I find it, a, a, it's difficult. For me to sort of really grapple with that because it's not me who's driving around in a convoy in Iraq, it's other people who drive around in these convoys. And we're asking them to do more and more and more with less and less and less. So either as a country we really get serious in implementation of national defense strategy goals, or we throw that out and we, we give these people what they need. You know, otherwise we are just like spreading them too thin without having a requisite change in the goals that they are supposed to achieve. Now, if the goal is the stabilization of Iraq and ensuring that the Iraqis have the capabilities to beat back what is expected to be a resurgent Islamic State sort of insurgency, right? If anything that we know <laughs> is that, you know, is that, uh, you know, the Islamic State, its predecessor, Islamic State Iraq, they're pretty resilient, even if they kind of get the you know, the, the stuff kicked out of them by, by, US, by US forces and local partner forces is that they can retain a very bare bones skeletal structure that allows them to coerce rent, money, and access to weapons in poorly governed spaces of both Iraq and then um, Western Syria. And so even though they're highly degraded, they aren't completely eliminated. You know, so if you draw down too fast, um, they ha you, know, you sort of take your, your you, you sort of lessen the pressure. But then the, con the counter argument that I struggle with as an analyst is, is it really within the capable capabilities of an external force to completely ever eradicate them? And so where is that push and pull to where it's good enough to where you can leave? Um, and I'm not sure that we've answered that question about what's good enough and what level of ISIS you know, infiltration we're willing to accept you know, as just the baseline to, to judge success of these missions. Certainly, um, uh, President Obama, who fulfilled the campaign promise in 2012 by pulling uh, all U.S. forces out of Iraq, uh, had the opportunity to determine that stability in Iraq was in America's interests. I think that would be a change with Joe Biden. I, just to preempt, I, I, you know, I think, you know, we're not going to see that again from Joe Biden. I mean, I, I just think, but, but what I know of Joe Biden, again, I, I, I've stood in the same room with him, you know, as I get 12 million people on the face of the planet have, you know, I, Joe Biden doesn't know me from a hole in the wall and I, 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 I don't know him all that well, um, other than what I read about him. But I do see him as somebody who is skeptical about both clandestine and covert action, uh, skeptical of large scale troop deployments at least is willing to ask the right questions. And I see him as somebody who, and I think you can see this particularly through his selection of a secretary of defense, right? The sort of consensus was that it would be Michelle Flournoy, but we ultimately end up with, uh, with, 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 uh, with somebody else. Lloyd Austin. Lloyd Austin, right. But like, I think it's because one, he works well with Lloyd Austin, but two, I don't think he and Michelle actually have overlapping policy points of view. And I think Joe Biden looks back in the mirror about the debates that they were having in 2008, 2012, 2000, up to 2016 and says, well, that was pretty right. You know, a slim down presence in Afghanistan would have been better in his mind. Um, and, you know, some of his like well-known resistance to covert action in Syria ultimately bore fruit because the results of that covert action were less than satisfactory. And so I think that's sort of ultimately what drives him. And so while I don't think we're going back to Obama, pull them all out, it's 2011, 2012, which Lloyd Austin is so famous for, but I don't think we're going to some level, you know, but I, it'll be somewhere in between those two levels. So it's actually kind of a recipe for me for status quo, as much as he and Donald Trump don't get along. Uh, and I think that goes back all the way to uh, Vietnam, which was one of the formative, uh, although he didn't go, was one of the formative experiences of Biden's early life. So I think a real skepticism on military interventions, which I think is one of the traits, foreign policy traits that he does share with the current president. Yeah. So I, I, I think uh, that's all exactly right. 
we, we've got a question that is right down uh, your, um, your alley. Um, discuss uh, American relations with Turkey under Trump and the prospects for better relations under Biden. Look, I mean, the U.S.-Turkish relationship is very bad. Like, it's just not good. And, and like, they've been trending poorly for a while, um, you know, dating back to the Obama administration, but well back into the Bush administration. I mean, this is not a new problem, is the Turkey problem. I think the, the, the Turkey problem has grown more acute because the Turks have become more aggressive not because the elements of the tensions between the two sides have changed all that much. Albeit with one caveat is that, well, two caveats, two sort of like major points is one is you can't separate Syria out of the deterioration of the relationship. Uh, you know, the, there, there's, there's two, there's two, there's two prongs off this. One is that the Turks did not seal that border. I lived in Turkey at the beginning of this, at the beginning of the Syrian civil war, that border was wide open school buses pulling up to the border, you open the back and just walk right across. Like that border was wide open. And a lot of the foreign militants that we ultimately had to kill came across that border. That's one. Two is that the Turks were um, not necessarily on the ISIS side, but you know, <laughs> weapons that were coming across that border were ending up in nasty dude's hands. No doubt about that. Okay. The other side was that our preferred method to fight the Islamic State war ultimately led us down a path where we gave weapons training and support to the YPG, uh, the People's Protections Units. The People's Protection Units is the militia to the Democratic Union Party, the PYD. The PYD is the Syrian branch of the Kurdistan Workers Party, the PKK. The Kurdistan Workers Party has been a low-level insurgency, a sometimes high-level insurgent threat to tur Turkish territorial st uh, stability since 1984. You know, so the PYD is the PKK. There is no difference, you know. And so when we went down, we, we created a bureaucratic difference for legal purposes. Um, but when we went down that pathway for ultimately justifiable reasons, that was one of the main problems. And obviously the Turks didn't help themselves. Two is obviously um, as a result of this, Ankara made countervailing moves, one of which was to get closer to Russia. One consequence of that was to buy a Russian air and missile defense system, which we sanctioned them for two days ago, yeah. yeah, on Monday. And of course, those sanctions are secondary sanctions because the sanctions that were passed in August 2017 were actually to bind the hands of President Trump because he was trying to lift sanctions on Russia. So the sanctions are on Russia, but there are secondary sanctions that if you do a significant transaction with a Russian Ministry of Defense or Ministry of Interior affiliated business, i.e. the you know, Russian defense industry, you are liable to U.S. sanctions and the Turks bought the S-400, the Russian air and missile defense system. Uh, it's all coming for a go. The Trump administration had a very strange relationship with Turkey. Very strange. One is that Donald Trump has business in Turkey. I used to work across the street from Trump Tower. Um, I used to work in this sort of dilapidated building right next door. Um, it's a shopping mall, it's condos, you know, and they were relatively fine. Um, and it's one of those deals where they license his name, you know, but he has ties into Turkey and they played those ties. They, they, they were, everybody had the back channel into the Trump administration in Turkey. Uh, and he liked Erdogan. It's, been, it's in the Woodward book and I have this from ultimately my own, you know, people who worked with Donald Trump is that he and Erdogan actually liked each other. Why? Who knows? They did. But you know, he would sometimes cater to his base, particularly the evangelical base. So when Turkey took uh, Pastor Brunson um, uh, hostage or they arrested him, um, there were sanctions put in place. But Donald Trump was wary of sanctioning Turkey. And so we had a hold back on the, um, on the, uh, on the CATSA sanctions for almost a year and a half, maybe even up to two years. I can't quite remember the exact sort of timeline. Um, and here's where I think the Turks actually like sort of shot themselves in the foot. Well, one is, is that in the campaign, they backed Trump, you know, which at the time I was like, why are you backing Donald Trump? Because at the, in his, his sort of late stages of his campaign, he was making sort of Islamophobic remarks and Turkey is a, a, an Islamist government and you sort of seeing a hill and water, but give credit to them. They ultimately read the man correctly is that this was a guy that they could do business with. Um, and Hillary was not. Um, and they read that correctly and they were able to manipulate that. But 
by Trump not instituting sanctions on Turkey, and there's all sorts of intervening moments, the fight at Sheridan Circle, uh, the invasions of Syria, Nagorno-Karabakh, the tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean, Libya, we can go around the, the map, um, is that Congress on a bipartisan level got angrier and angrier and angrier until ultimately CATSA had to be imposed or otherwise it would be forced upon the president. And that's how we got to this point where we are today. One potential positive for the incoming Biden administration, but it's also a negative, is that they have a lot of history. Erdogan and Biden have known each other since 2002, since Erdogan was, was well, 2003, through Senate trips, and then ultimately through Biden as vice president. He was sort of the Erdogan handholder. Tony Blinken, the, this, you know, the, the future Secretary of State, knows Turkey very well. Um, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, knows Turkey very well. They all have gone there, but they were all tangled up in Syria. And, you know, so I see one positive is that the implementation of sanctions now means that Joe Biden can lift them. But in order to lift them, the Turks have to do some stuff. And if the Turks don't do that, st do that stuff, then the, uh, the sanctions will remain and the relationship will get worse. Our, you know, it's not just us who has bad relations with the Turks. The Europeans have you know, their relations with the Turks have tanked over Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean. And Joe Biden was the Cyprus guy. He was the envoy to Cyprus, as was Tony Blinken. So one potential, like if I was advising them, and I'm not, but like if I was advising the Biden administration, I'd be like one intractical prop, intract in one sort of relatively comparatively benign frozen conflict in the Middle East adjacent <laughs> in Cyprus is something that may be worth spending some time and energy on. Because if you can unlock Cyprus, you can sort of downgrade tensions between Greece, Turkey, France, Turkey, all the NATO powers, and then you can really sort of gear up on Russia. But Cyprus has been sort of intractable since 1974 for a reason. And so smarter people have tried. And so it's unlikely it will be resolved, but it's where I would put my eggs if I had to, uh, it's where I would put my chips in if I had to make a long shot bet. Uh, staying with um, American allies of a sort um, run by autocratic governments with some human rights challenges, we haven't talked about Saudi Arabia at all, arguably. Uh, one of the more important uh, countries in the region, the, the place that Donald Trump took his first foreign visit. I'm guessing Joe Biden won't follow that particular yeah. Uh, th that particular lead, but talk about uh, U.S. relations with Saudi under Donald Trump and and prospects under Joe Biden. Well, they, I mean, look the the, the relationship between you know, Saudi and the U.S. during the Trump administration, I, I just would, I mean, artificially high. I mean, just like tremendously, like in, I mean, just just they were excellent. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, you know, and they were insulated from. The, the the broader challenges that Saudi poses, i.e. the dismemberment of a dissident kind of activist slash journalist and Jamal Khashoggi, who I actually sat next to at dinner. I mean, most people know him. I mean, I knew him, you know, and when I, I'll never forget where I was when I found out he was killed. I was in Vernick, you know, having a nice dinner in Philadelphia. Um, but, uh, you know, when Jamal was dismembered um, and, you know, either buried or, or incinerate or burned alive or put in acid, obviously that raises some problems um, for human rights. The other thing is, is their sort of indiscriminate bombing campaign um, in Yemen. And where you have seen movement, you know, in push against the Trump administration was in Congress, which was trying to block um, arms sales and ultimately successful, forcing Trump to override. Uh, and so if I had to sort of, but then again, you know, if you look at the constellation of U.S. basing and interests in the region, Saudi Arabia is critical. It's critical to, a, to, a, uh, to an overarching policy of both, one, keeping an eye on the nasty dudes. You know, their, their intelligence services are important for tracking Islamic State and Al-Qaeda and helping us. And two is, you know, basing infrastructure for uh, pressuring Iran. It's that push and pull between the relationships. So it will not be as good as it was. The, the, the congressional, the, the overall top cover provided by the administration in Congress for the relationship will never be what it was. But I don't see a full severing of the relationship at all. You know, if anything, it may just sort of 
recalibrates into a more normal um, um, state of being, which is functional and, and relatively copacetic at the working levels, but you know perhaps politically very difficult. And you see this in the, how they're trying to respond, and they're dumping millions of dollars into lobbying and PR, which won't work. I always laugh. You know, like I'm available for half the price, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, uh, but nevertheless, it's tried and true of these foreign dictators is to just dump a whole bunch of money into Washington PR firms to try and help them out on uh, on K Street. Um. Two, two points. Uh, first, uh, what is the impact of low oil prices as a result of, of the global COVID depression on, on both on, on Saudi Arabia's freedom of action and then across the broader Middle East? Uh, I mean, I, I'll say, you know, the ones that we, I think we see it most in, in perhaps the, you know, the areas that we care most about. I mean, we care most about the entirety of the Gulf region but I would say in sort of the fragile state of Iraq, both the Kurdistan region and the uh, and, and sort of federal Iraq, is it's just with so many public service employees that receive money from, um, you know, essentially the government, you know, as a handout, either for being a state employee or, or even these ghost workers, is the amount of budget deficits from these sustained low oil prices will be considerable and perhaps you know, lead to destitu you know, further destitution, further poverty, and then how that creates cyclical and upward boiling forces that allows for recruitment from people like the Islamic State. You know, I think this has artificially hurt the Iranians, you know, so some of the successes that we talked about in the maximum pressure strategy can also be sort of tuned up to um, uh, low oil prices. So it's the, it's the twofer for them, driving down their oil exports through sanctions, but also, you know, that oil not not being as lucrative as ever and you see this in saudi public financing you know to support the war in yemen to support their own rentier status um, um is you know record levels of, of deficits perhaps for the first time in um in, in in how they fund themselves i would say for the really wealthy arab states though like the saudis the emirati certainly the qataris you know they are integrated enough with global finance to where they, they can ride this out you know, it's more the fragile ones like Iraq, and then the even more fragile ones, um, you know, not even oil producing states, but like Jordan and places like that, where they live on the edge of poverty, um, where, uh, you know, the combination of COVID, economic down, uh, the economic uh, downturns, um, really just, you know, make these states sort of like the rest of us, which is we're dealing with the calamities of a global pandemic pandemic, you know, in places where, you know, uh, you know, it just, just the calamities of the global pandemic and that, you know, we're not unique and they're not unique and they, we just have all these problems stemming from it. We've had a number of questions about human rights, uh, the um, uh, relative lack of emphasis, perhaps, so by the Trump administration on uh, the enforcement of human rights uh, abroad and in particular in the Middle East. And uh, any sense that that's going to change under a Biden administration? I think so. I mean, I just think as a general like reversion um, to sort of like again like more normal execution of U.S. foreign policy. Um, the fact that it's a left of center U.S. government, you know, this higher prioritization. And you know, like this, I feel like so much of this is like like Bidenology is just looking at the public statements of like Jake Sullivan on on social media is that their their top priorities is like human rights, um, at least as as what they're tweeting. When the rubber hits the road, you know, and we need that security cooperation with, say, like the Iraqi Kurds who are now <laughs> oppressing their own people for, for, uh, for, uh, for protesting in the streets, particularly in Sinemani, I don't know how, how it will actually tangibly come out. But I certainly do think it will be rhetorically a more important, you know, prong of U.S. foreign policy. We've got a, a sort of an interesting question. There are apparently memes running around saying that the PKK is training and supporting Antifa here in the United States. No, no, that, that was around. I saw those. It's, it's just ludicrous. I mean, look, the PKK and the far leftist groups in Syria attracted like some whack jobs. And so like, is it true that there are some Americans who went to go fight with the YPG against ISIS in Syria? Absolutely. Are some of those guys maybe wearing an Antifa shirt? Sure. You know, is the PKK training Antifa? Let's get serious, right? <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, probably if you sort of like do that crazy, I don't know, that crazy meme, like where you're connecting all these weird dots. Sure, you can say that, but of course that's not true. 
Uh, that is that is uh, my assessment as well, but I thought it was sort of a fun question as we near the end of our time. Uh, I'd like to give you the chance to, you, you mentioned that uh, Joe Biden couldn't pick you out of a lineup. I don't think those are your exact words, but-, but uh, No, that's true. Oh, I mean, it's not my exact words, but it's true. Okay. Um, but uh, um, what we have seen uh, a foreign policy team uh, right, uh, emerge uh, as, as uh, um, President-elect Biden uh, makes his calls. Can you give your assessment of this team and of what you expect their priorities and focus to be? And you just talked a little bit about uh, a little mo more of a focus on human rights, for instance, at least rhetorically. I mean, it, it, it's, it's very familiar faces. I mean, most of the people who are coming in are people who, are, who have worked with Joe Biden for a very long time, who he's comfortable with, uh, and people who have extensive experience working in government under the Obama administration. You know, so it, it's, it's not the sort of like, novice team that came in under the Trump administration, and certainly not the type of people that came in under, Biden, uh, under Obama one, right? And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it, it's a much more experienced group. Um, and so I, I think that bodes well for the country, um, whether you sort of support supported Biden or not, it, you know, they're, they're the people who are in charge at least can find the light switches. I will say and this is not some sort of deep thinking and not what other people haven't said is that foreign policy, like foreign policy is usually the second half of a presidency, right? It's years two and on. The first two years is going to have to be COVID. Economic relief, COVID relief, distribution of the vaccine, rolling it out to children, getting all of us back in school, stuff like that. So this is gonna be an inward looking presidency for at least two years. And yes, the big grandiose foreign policy could come about later, but if I had to just guess what their, the main focus will be on in the Middle East, it will be on managing the Iranian nuclear issue. Everything else I think will be subordinate to that. I don't think you're going to see massive sort of changes in U.S. posture in the Middle East or, or, or anything along those lines. In fact, I think you're going to kind of see a lot of status quo. You know, uh, you know I, I, I think we're going to retain U.S. troop presence in Iraq. I think we're going to have a low level of presence in Syria. And I think we'll even retain some presence in Afghanistan or maybe Afghanistan is the, is, is the outlier. But I don't see these monumental shifts coming in U.S. foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East. I just don't think there's the bandwidth for it um, um, coming along. And that, the other thing is that I think we're going to go into an era. The only place to cut the U.S. budget, if you don't raise taxes, is the defense budget. And so I do think we're, we're in for a period of either flat or declining defense budget. And that will make prioritization even more important as an element of national strategy. And I, you know, I say this as somebody who gets paid to analyze the Middle East, we should be focusing on China and we should be focusing on Russia and Europe. They are bigger threats than what's going on in the Middle East. It doesn't mean we take our foot off the gas and like totally withdraw from the region, but it means we put it in perspective in terms of the priorities of a nation that has to deal with stuff internally rather than externally. Larry, well, that's a wonderful way to sum up what's been just a fascinating and for me at least very enjoyable conversation. Some great questions uh, from our audience. Delighted to have 175, I think, folks uh, here as uh, part of this conversation. Uh, from the Haverford School, um, uh, allow me to say what a pleasure it is hosting these events and allow me to wish everybody a super happy holiday. Aaron, final words from you before we turn it over to Raleigh? Uh, no, it's just in, enjoy the snow. I think I have a snowman on my agenda with my five-year-old. So I think that's my next stop. And, and uh, congratulations to your wife on keeping them not a part of this conversation. Yeah. Uh, as enjoyable as that would have been. Yeah. Uh, Raleigh, over to you to bring us home. Uh, thank you both for, for a truly fascinating conversation. And Aaron, we definitely have to have you back. That, that you know, we didn't get to touch on... The, all the issues, and, and certainly there was not enough time for that, but it was terrific. Um, and you all, our audience, have also been terrific. Uh, you've been with us all year during this extraordinary year. Uh, I say it often, but it's heartfelt. Uh, we could not do this without you. Uh, th thank you, John uh, Noggle and the Haverford School for, uh, for um, hosting us, and we'll continue to do so in the new year. This is our 
last program uh, of this calendar year. And so once again, thank you. Uh, we wish you a very happy and healthy holiday season and a much better 2021. And we will see you in the new year. Take care and stay safe.